On this episode, we are talking about the movie Synchronic, how it stands aside from other time travel movies, why we're excited for Moon Knight, and much more. You guys can pick up Synchronic everywhere, wherever you guys get digital and physical media. I'm Captain Nostalgia, and this is the Victims and Villains Podcast, a podcast extension of the nonprofit that educates and engages individuals on mental health awareness and suicide prevention through pop culture. So buckle in, things are about to get a little weird. Well, it might be wrong turn week here at Victims and Villains, but at our core, we are still film fans, and we are here talking about Sin Chronic, the brand new time travel movie from Moorhead and Benson, who uh, one of who my guests for this episode and co-host uh, got a chance to interview just a little bit a couple weeks back. He is a staff writer here with us at Victims and Villains. He is also a podcaster, one and a half of the Nerf Herders Assemble podcast, and he is the author behind not one, but three books that make up the Fear Saga, Mr. Joshua Howell. <laughs> that's that's one hell of an intro. Thanks, <laughs> Thanks buddy. I <laughs> I appreciate that. I was waiting for you to like cue like some fake like audience like roars, you know, of clapping and everything. But uh, yeah, wow, you made me feel real special there. Thanks, bud. I uh, I'm not gonna lie. I worked on that intro way too long. <laughs> That's awesome. Well, I appreciate it, bud. Thanks for having me. Yeah, I, man. Um, I I'm I'm happy to talk about this because uh, even before I knew we got a screener for it, I saw a trailer. <laughs> Um, and was just fascinated by the concept of this film. And and uh, if, if anyone's seen my review on it, I really liked it. So we will include in the description below not only where you guys can buy Synchronic, because Synchronic now is on all platforms. It is on DVD, digital, Blu-ray, mm-hmm. and I highly recommend picking up the, the Blu-ray because it is loaded with special features, including uh, commentary with the directors and producer, a making of commentary, lots of visual comment, lots of like before and after with some of the, the visualization special effects that happen in here, and a, uh, a joke alternate ending, which <laughs> after <laughs> watching this, so they, they interviewed, or they introed this joke alternate ending and apparently every movie that they've shot so far which this is their this is their fourth film right or fifth yes full fourth feature film yeah so every every film that they all that they do they always shoot an alternate ending for it and it's always a joke alternate ending so interesting i kind of want to go through and and find these but we're officially in spoiler territories so uh let's go ahead and uh, let me finish that statement real quick uh before we get to, i'm so excited to talk about this movie um you guys can will find links for not only josh's interview with the directors but also at the same time you guys can also find a uh link to pick up a copy for yourself and uh i'm gonna start it over to you this was one of your favorite films of last year and what are your kind of general thoughts coming out of this movie um yeah it was it was um if uh i did a top 10 for nerf herders assemble um which is the other podcast i'm on and and it was in my top 10 i didn't rank them one through 10 or anything but um uh and and as as far as i can tell um that's not really with the caveat of 2020 there were uh when i was going back on that list i realized there was still a ton of films that came out in 2020 maybe not Maybe not the Dunes and, you know, the King Kongs versus Godzilla movies that we were excited about and the Fast Nine and the the Bond movies. Um, Yeah, those films didn't come out, but a a lot of other films did and a lot of other studios didn't have the the bank accounts to just wait uh, and, and release it later or major streaming networks to release on. So a lot of films really did come out and I still was able to easily find my top 10. Um, even though I, I will admit there was a lot of not great movies of 2020, but Mm -hmm. synchronic, um, you know, the trailer sold me, first of all, I had never 
seen a Benson Moorhead film before, let alone heard of them as a duo. Um, uh, but the trailer alone sold me on this uh, visual, artistic uh, mystery film um, that might have had to do with time travel, uh, might have had to do with you know drug hallucinations or a mix of it all. And that's exactly what you get. It was a gorgeous looking film. Um, in my mind, it was a it was a very well written film. Um, it had a great cast. Um, and um, afterwards, I went back and watched the three films that they had done previously, and I believe this is their best movie yet in terms of scope and uh, just uh, overall. It was a it was a great film in my mind. It should also be worth pointing out that these guys, Synchronic, really kind of opened up their visibility because like right before this movie went to digital and like streaming they marvel announced that these guys are starting to become at early talks to be involved with the the moon knight series that is going to be coming soon on disney plus with which after watching this i really want to kind of take a page out of your book and go check out some of their other films that they've done and I'm super stoked on on seeing what they're going to be able to bring to the Moon Knight character. Yeah, their their other films are more rooted in horror, um, or at least horror elements than Synchronic was. Synchronic still had horror elements in my mind, but I, I think it was uh, more a sci-fi film than a horror film. But their other films, um, Resolution, The Endless, and Spring, um, they weren't like full-on like horror films there were horror films mixed with other elements but they were very well done um for their budget and and um you know you could just tell each each film as it went along they just they got more and more in tune with their abilities they they tightened things up a little bit more um uh moorhead is the cinematographer of the of the two and, and benson is the writer and you 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 start to see you know the, the tricks that Moorhead likes to use and the and the camera work that he's really good at. Um, and then I just feel like, uh, and granted, I haven't seen, I know they also did an episode of The Twilight Zone. Um, they were hired on to do one of those episodes. I haven't seen any of those uh, of Jordan Peele's Twilight Zone. But I, I do feel like this is the pinnacle of their work so far. And I thought that it was a very well-made film. Um for the for the budget it had and i i thought it was very slick so you gave this movie a five out of five on your mm-hmm. review and i mm-hmm. went a little bit le- a little bit lower than you and gave I it a 3.5 <laughs> when i read this on letterboxd and uh what I, did I, you give it you gave it a what? 3.5 okay 3.5 all right so i i have a couple problems like just thematically with how they use some characters and I feel like for me I would have liked the element of like the synchronic to kind of come in a little bit earlier and I really kind of wanted them to do a little bit more with the the chemist character I felt like when the news broadcast announced his suicide it was like man it's not yeah. where I thought it was going, but also like that's a compelling character. I feel like we could have gotten a little bit more out of. Sure, and I had kind of talked to them a little bit about that, um, not specifically about the chemist dying too quickly, but I had mentioned to them that you know I've seen a lot of time travel movies. I've seen a lot of you know synthetic drug movies that gives you powers or or other stuff like that, and I and I've seen a lot of lesser. Um, indie films that tried to blow up the scale of the story beyond its means. And I uh, I just really appreciated that they kept this movie very tight. They kept it within a certain area. You know, they didn't jump back and forth between, you know, five different characters that were experiencing the same thing as Anthony Mackie's character. You know, they did make decisions like killing off the chemist to really uh, further keep the story contained. But I, I I appreciated the consequences of things like that because, you know, if the chemist is dead um, and the chemist has been going around to these, you know, uh, convenience shops and buying up and destroying the, the synchronic, then whatever Anthony Mackie had on him was really 
the last stuff. It wasn't like Limitless where, you know, you just needed to find another – uh, another, you know, uh, manufacturer to make those clear pills. You know, it was literally what Anthony Mackie had, the five to seven pills he had was it. And it, it, it installed an urgency and stakes and consequences into the film that I would really appreciate to the point where I was counting how many pills he had left and thinking, you know, shit, he, he, he has no room to mess up. Oh, don't get me wrong. When you're talking about whether or not this is a great time travel movie, I would put this up there with Back to the Future because I feel like this movie lays out and walks you through how Synchronic works as a time machine element while also at the same time also keeping its consequences intact. The fact that Anthony Mackie doesn't make it back in the end, it is heartbreaking. The fact that Hawkins doesn't make it uh, and stays in the past, again, it's it's super heartbreaking. Uh, my wife and I were watching the scene where he like looks out of his window and he just sees Hawkins and we both like almost like wanted to cry because it's one of the saddest moments in the movie, but it also shows you that there is a, a gravity for when you mess with the laws of, of nature. And I feel like that's something that like you had said in your interview, like that a lot of time travel movies never really take into consideration. I think the closest thing that we've ever seen prior to synchronic was probably um the death of black widow in endgame like that's mm. maybe the closest to this like type of like time travel we've ever seen um so i i do really enjoy that aspect of this movie yeah yeah i really um you know like i said it is more of a sci-fi movie than a horror movie but the more you think about it the more horrible it was. I mean, it, <laughs> I did like when, uh, you know, the more he, he did his experiments, the more he found himself in a bar just saying, like, time travel sucks, you know? And, <laughs> and any any nostalgia you have uh, about the past is is not real because you've never lived there, you know? For all of the, for all of the things that you've ever wished you could experience about the past, there are hundreds of reasons why everybody else hated it you know like the victorian era sure if you were lucky enough to be at a ball uh that's what well, that was great but then you know if you weren't uh, of the elitist class you were dealing with all the diseases and all the you know all the plagues and all the the shit of that day and i just appreciated that no matter what time period he went back to it was scary even even with the slightly more modern time periods where they had homes and shit you were just like, oh wait, this is this is this area of the country at this time in the country's past, and you know this man ain't white, and uh, you just realized that no matter how he tried to explain himself, uh, if he didn't run, he was getting killed, and uh, I just I, I liked that. I liked how you just didn't know what to expect every time you went back, but you were tense every time he did. Yeah, and he went back to some like really horrific times and I felt so so heavy for was it Brianna, the um, Dennis's daughter that got mm -hmm. stuck in like one of like the war battlegrounds when she tried to um synchronic and so he his entire journey throughout the entire like second half of the movies attempting to get back to bring her back to Dennis. And but like every time that he's like going through it, um, is it the voodoo scene that he like first gets in there and he uh he like comes back and he like barely makes it back and so he like sits down oh, in the yeah. chair and he's like shaking off all the like the tree just crap that's on him and uh the chick just comes out, she's like, What are you doing on my roof? And I, I, I really <laughs> loved the the way that they approach comedy throughout the course of this because it, it just it catches you off guard every single time yeah uh that is a uh, bet benson is very talented with with uh the pen and he has a good brand of humor throughout all of these films that i really appreciated but yeah this this was good uh the, the humor was good the relationship between 
uh, Dennis and um, Steve, I just I thought was very natural. You know, you you got the sense that these guys have known each other since school, that they've grown up with each other. Um, but at the same time, they're so manly ish that they keep to themselves, you know, that their best friends don't know the shit that's going on in the other man's home or in the other man's life. And uh, it, I thought that was very well done that, you know, as close as they are, they're really far apart and they're making a lot of assumptions of the quality of life of their, you know, their friend. Absolutely. The the chemistry between Doran and Mackie was really, really superior um, that we've kind of seen we haven't really seen in a lot of the other time travel movies. I feel like time travel movies are generically like overblown. Whereas this one, there's an intimacy to it that I, I really admired. And like you said, I think you, you just captured it really correctly. Like the, the depth of their relationship, it's this very close, but yet so very far away because, you know, um, Anthony Mackie throughout the course of this until he takes synchronic like he is just a miserable depressed guy just trying to like get as high and as drunk as possible to still function and still do his job but also at the same time to just kind of disappear from the realities of you know being single and having a cancer I think the the scene in the strip club really kind of captured that where he was just like you know F you basically for, you know, having someone that you can go home to and, and it cares about you. It must be terrible. Yeah, he was uh, he was having a hard time sympathizing uh, with uh, Dornan's character about, oh, yeah, having a family must be rough. Yeah, um, he uh, Anthony Mackie. I mean, we, we know him as Falcon in the MCU. He he just has this charisma, man. No matter what role he's in, um, he did that one movie that I didn't really care for, but it was with The Rock and Wahlberg. Uh, do you oh, know what I'm talking about? Pain and Gain. Yeah, yeah. He was in that movie. He got beefed up in that movie. But even in that movie, I really liked him. But, I mean, and, and I just watched his newest movie on Netflix, Outside the Wire. Uh, didn't really care for it. But he brings so much to the screen, so even if the movie is shitty... He elevates, you know, the scene, and I thought that I was so happy that this film didn't suck because he he was great in it. And then Dornan, I've always been a fan of Dornan. I never liked the Fifty Shades movies, but before I saw the Fifty Shades movies, I saw him in the fall uh, with um, with Scully from X Files, and he played this woman uh, serial killer, and he was just bombastic in that show i loved him so much in the fall and i feel like he doesn't get enough work and uh i gotta be honest i mean seeing the previous films that benson and moorhead did when i saw that their next film had these two lead actors i was like man whoever you impressed to get this cast that's awesome and and it really sold the film that much more i think in mackie's case he's been trying to kind of like break away from the mcu so he's not necessarily getting typecast because we are on the heels of him getting ready to step into the shoes of captain america i think it's been something that all of us have been desperately anticipating since he garnered the shield at the end of endgame but i've been enjoying kind of seeing him take on these other roles he was in uh i think it was called the banker last year with samuel jackson Mm -hmm. was in apple film um he was did outside the wire he's done a couple episodes uh no uh, he did that other netflix series too um altered carbon he did the second oh, yeah, season that's of that right. that's um, right, he did. and mm-hmm. so he he's just been kind of taking it like to different places and i like the way that uh Coles had had put it on his twitter he had said that you know he's gearing up to be the next samuel L. jackson because he's just popping up in all of these things and <laughs> he's just kind of trying different things and and taking his career and really challenging his craft and i feel like i've never seen him in anything outside of the mcu so the synchronic was kind of like my first like breakaway to see like really what he had as an actor and like coming out of this film i'm like man i want to see what this guy does next because he just goes through such a this like wide range of emotions to where like he's he's drunken for you know 
a quarter of the movie, he's depressed for another quarter of the movie, and then he's like big boy hero the rest of the movie and just how hard he fights and how much he sacrifices throughout the course of this movie and just how much his character steve really goes through like it just made me really admire him as an actor and i think that he's just starting to really kind of hone and shape his craft and show what he's capable of uh yeah i agree he shows a lot of range in in synchronic um, and having just watched the Outside the Wire movie last week, um, I felt that that was more his typical large and in charge, a full charisma uh, type character um, with a lot of sass and a lot of jokes and a lot of you know of loudness about him. Whereas Synchronic um, was a, a more layered character, and it wasn't just you know be be your typical loud, awesome fun self it was you know he was displaying a lot more emotions than i've seen him display in other in other projects so yeah i agree with you i think he he went through a lot and his character needed him to go through a lot because yeah i mean like i said his his partner sees this bachelor who's you know who's coming to shift in someone else's clothes who's going to parties who's doing one night stands with people he met somewhere somehow um and just thinks that you know Mac Anthony Mackie's living up the life when in reality it's just he's just trying to get by and then on top of that shit he finds out he's got cancer and then you know the 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 obstacles and the burdens just keep piling up on him um and uh and he's uh you know he's alone in a lot of ways and and I think he portrayed that as an actor really well and and brought that character uh, to screen i think one of the things that makes his character so compelling is the way that time is handled in this movie is really interesting because it it seems like a pretty straightforward movie for the first act and then once you kind of get into the second act there are pieces of the narrative that you're only seeing little bits of and then down the line you'll see a little bit more of a previous scene that you had seen so you're kind of like getting a fuller context they do it a lot with doran's character but maggie's character has these keeps having these like visions every time that he goes to sleep and it's just these three graves on this beach that's like slightly ajar and you you kind of are like all right well what's what's kind of going on with this and then you come to find out that it's been his family the entire time like he was a orphan of sorts and i think that you know when you have something that traumatic happen at you know however young of an age you are kind of you're already basically setting yourself up to be that damaged individual that we meet when synchronic starts and kind of getting that backstory i think that moorhead and benson handle that really well and it also bodes to kind of show about how uh you know childhood can really affect your mental health heading into adulthood whether you know it or not Sure, sure. And I I know you had told me that there were some side plots or some elements of this film that that didn't necessarily need to be there. I would even though I gave it 5 out of 5 and I and I appreciated that those scenes, I would think that, uh, I would say that the the graves stuff was it that important to the plot. However, I appreciated that that was just one of the several things that Benson and Moorhead did to really ground you in this location because it wasn't just that, you know, someone had pulled the graves up out of the ground. It was Hurricane Katrina that pulled them out. And they, you know, the the people that they come across, they're paramedics. So they're, they're, they're night shift paramedics. So they're coming across a lot of crazy shit. And the people that they come across, the scenarios – um, and, and then also the, the different landscapes that Mackie goes to when he goes back in time, it all ties into the location of New Orleans. And I thought, you know, um, sometimes you have a movie or a story where they don't even tell you where it is cause they don't want to bother with the trouble of really making it true to that location. And I thought Benson and Moorhead did enough to really solidify that this story and all of its elements were in was in new orleans 
And then they did several little things to back that up. So I appreciated that. I liked the, yeah, I really enjoyed that. I think that also the, the use of like the subtle nods that they brought into voodoo culture really mm-hmm. made that feel more authentic. And it's only in two scenes, but those two scenes that give you enough. It's one where he goes back in time and he sees the, like, probably like 10 to 12 people dancing around the fire and they believe him to be some kind of like spirit from heaven and the second one is you know where it ultimately ends up in the two characters of steven dennis stopping talking um but it ultimately is because of you know this like voodoo daddy is kind of like ODing or like tripping on something hard which is one of the weirdest and most uncomfortable scenes to to watch because you have this tension going there, but you also have this guy that's just like screaming chaotically in the background. So you're like, it, it kind of feels like you're supposed to be laughing, but also supposed to be on like the edge of your seat. I was like, I don't know about you, but I just didn't know how to feel during that scene. If you or someone you know is listening to this podcast right now and you're struggling with suicide, addiction, self-harm, or depression we encourage you guys to please reach out this is the heartbeat of why we do what we do suicide is currently the 10th leading cause of death in the united states and as of this recording there are 132 suicides that take place each and every day on american soil and when you scale back internationally there are 800,000 successful suicides that is one death roughly every 40 seconds so if you were someone you know is struggling you guys can go to victimsandvillains.net forward slash hope that resource is going to be right in the description wherever you guys are currently listening or streaming this there you'll find resources that include the national suicide lifeline which is 1-800-273-8255 you can also text help to 741-741 we also have a plethora of other resources including churches getting connected with counselors lgbt resources like the trevor project and also veteran hotline as well please if you hear nothing else in the show, understand that you, yes, you listening to this right now, have value and worth. We get it. Suicide, depression, mental health, these are hard topics, and the stigma around them doesn't make it any easier. But please consider the resources right in the descriptions below, wherever you guys are listening, because, once again, you have value and you have worth. So please, stay with us. I I thought it was um, appropriate chaos for what paramedics probably go through a lot. I I'm I'm sure. Granted, I'm not a paramedic, but I am sure for those that work with the same people every night uh, and they see the same, you know, they see different crazy shit every night. I I imagine, you know, if they ever try to have conversations, it's always over and around you know the the crazy stuff that they're having to deal with on that shift and so it was a you know it was already a tense situation but when you were thinking about the other factors in that scene you had uh jamie dornan's character thinking that his partner was uh becoming a stereotypical paramedic druggie um and taking taking drugs off the off the uh off the truck or or you know partying too hard because every second you know Anthony Mackie's character is popping off to the side and throwing up all over the place and you know he's he's uh, he's popping pills he's rubbing his forehead you know it, he doesn't he hasn't told his partner that he has cancer so you know the assumptions are just leading up to things and and uh, yeah so it was that tension uh, and then like you said at the same time you had this. You had this tripped out voodoo guy who was just going off and not helping the situation. So I, I appreciated the chaos of the scene. But um, yeah, yeah, I, I get what you're saying. Very uncomfortable chaos. <laughs> <laughs> One of the things that I, I think we should talk about, too, is kind of the reinvention almost of the way that this movie does time travel. The way it's kind of this um, mysterious drug that starts to sweep a lot of these um, 
drug users or people that are like wanting to experiment. And mm-hmm. this movie just throws you right into the thralls of Synchronic right away without really knowing it. And I appreciate how detailed a lot of the first couple of trips that we go on throughout the drug use. And Mackie's character is kind of like trying to understand what it is and kind of really why people are are ODing and what makes this drug so bad. But how did you kind of feel about the use of the drug being a a form of time travel? Um, I, I loved it. And, and this is one of the reasons why I really, really love this movie because I've seen so many time travel movies. So many, it's, it's gotta be its own genre by now. Uh, it's at least its own subgenre. Uh, time travel and i i despise when a movie just says oh yeah I, I built this time machine on accident or oh yeah i've got this rig and it it turns out it's a time machine and you're just like what what how <laughs> why you know and then you know your 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 disbelief is just all over the place and then it just ruins the experience i appreciate when films like this and i'll give you another example that that came out of 2020 was Andy Samberg's Palm Springs. Mm. Um, that had a time travel device. Was it some crazy rig? No, it was a light in a cave that you that you got no more explanation for than that. But the fact that the movie that was built around that was so damn good, you didn't care. You didn't need to understand the science behind that light in the cave. You just knew that that was the reason. And you get a little more science talk than this. In fact, they give you a lot more than I expected. And on second watch, I picked up a lot more talking about the pieces of the brain and why Mackie could go back in time where most adults couldn't because a part of his brain was as wasn't as, as matured and calcified as an average adult his age and why these teenagers were, were getting stuck back in time whereas adults were coming back and usually – you know dying because of the trip so you got some science um and then you get you get the scene where the scientist is you know instead of showing the pencil through the paper he shows you the record and the needle and he gives you a little bit of talk but they don't blow it up more than that they don't spend a ton of time on that they just give you a little bit and then they build a great movie around it and i really appreciated the the direction of using a synthetic drug because that shit is all over the place. You go into any uh, a convenience store or drug store or or um, you know shady um, um, gas station, you'll see kratom, you'll see all these uh, faux you know drugs, which are you know which are I'm sure those companies are getting a little afraid as more and more uh, as more and more states are legalizing marijuana and stuff like that in fact i think even crack is now legal in seattle or something like that but oh, wow. uh <laughs> which is crazy but uh, i really appreciated that they, they tackled the synthetic drug and you know what's really in that what what are these what are these chemists really putting in this thing to simulate a high but it's not the natural ingredient um and is that really safer or is or are you worse off um, I just thought that was great. I thought it was simplistic, that it wasn't, you know, it's crazy complicated, and they said it, and then they moved on, and they built a great film around it, and that's why it worked for me, where a lot of other time travel films have just failed miserably, because the setup and the film built around it was just, just sloppy. Yeah, they start to, like, tend to run together and get, like, really generic, and I really enjoyed the needle scene as well, the way that he explains it using a vinyl, and kind of, like, what makes Mackie so special, and I I will say, though, that when it comes to the specific use of, like, time travel, like, I enjoyed kind of going through the journey with Mackie, like as he's discovering the rules of how synchronic works and how the time travel works, we're getting that. It felt like those like authentic, what you would imagine like drug trials kind of feel like. And that made the movie so much more authentic for me. But here you also have a guy too that, you know, 
I think that this kind of gives him the the win to kind of go out on a hero because you know he's grappling with the fact that he's been diagnosed with cancer he's been you know he's got this like distance relationship like he doesn't really have anyone so there's a lot of like depression that's circling him that he's been drowning out with booze and pills and to kind of give him the chance to say i can die a hero is a great way to kind of give that character a, a send-off like it feels like a proper send-off when he shakes his hand at the very end of the film um because after all you either live long enough to see yourself become the villain or you die the hero <laughs> nice very nice yeah um uh it it was it was a great tool it was a great tool and it was a great uh experience every time he went back it was dirty it was messy um, you didn't know, you didn't know where you were going to end up. All you knew is if you took the pill and stepped over to the right, you could end up in a totally different era, you know? And, um, I appreciated, you know, him getting out that camcorder and, and the, and the, you know, the whiteboard and writing down these rules. I really liked that. But then at the same time, as soon as you think like, okay, these are the basic rules. Now go save her. Then he would come, then he would find out, oh, but if you're not standing in that same spot, you know, when seven minutes are done, you're stuck. And then you got to take another pill to get back. And just the, the the more things he found out, I just liked that it didn't get so complex that you're just like trying to keep track of all the rules. They were basic enough, but the consequences were still there that it wasn't. I mean, the, the, the uh, one of his last trips before he goes to get Brianna was was coming up on that on that voodoo group. And you're like, crap, uh, what if he forgot what tree he fell out of, you know, and and is he leaving him? Like, I was just thinking if I was in this situation, would I mark the tree? Would I leave breadcrumbs? You know, how does he know what branch he was on? And then at the end, he's just barely getting there in time and just like pulling himself back to the present by latching himself onto that chair. And I was just like, man, this this did so well with 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 informing me of the consequences and really making me feel the stakes of this film that by the time he finally does you know get to that last trip where he's going to save brianna you're just like please just you know don't no side quests don't get distracted uh you know who cares what's whistling just get the job done and you're aching every time there's an obstacle in his spot and i just i just thought that was really portrayed and and written well yeah and i i feel like what we've seen in in other time travel movies you just kind of roll the dice and wherever you land is somehow a magical happy ending for you and like you know if you're marty mcfly you're trying to play matchmaker with your parents and you end up being a cool cat that is -hmm. named calvin klein (laughs) and but then you here it's like like you said like every spot that you take the drug it's somewhere different and he learns that very quickly he learns it in the you know the first place that he tries to go he's like almost like hunted by uh a a racist right or is that the, is that one of the later ones that's one of the later ones the first one's in the swamp with yeah. the french co- a colonizer and the and yeah, the, that's right. the gator. So, so he, <laughs> he was either going to die place. by the gator or the or the French conquistador type guy. And then the second one that he goes to is like just like sub zero middle of nowhere, <laughs> and yep. mm-hmm. like he's like trying to like thaw out in the bathtub. And I just liked how every place that you end up going, you are facing a heavy consequence. And I think it's a bold statement too to kind of bring a black man back into some of these very very heavily racist times in our history um and we we kind of see some of that play out with uh some of the later times in the the like with the kkk in one point and then also at the very end with the guy that and lands on the um landmine like in order for brianna to get away like he basically has to demoralize himself and call himself a slave yeah, well, and then on top of that, he's dressed in modern-day clothing. 
Um, Mm -hmm. And if they saw him up here, then to them, he looks like a ghost. And, you know, at first you're just like, just run, man, just get out of there. But then as soon as you realize that once that seven minutes is up, if he's not back in his initial spot, he ain't going home. Then you're just like, well, this is even more terrifying because you have to figure out a way to stay in your spot for seven long minutes while everything around you wants to kill you. <laughs> you know? So it's a scary scenario. Um, and then you, you you add up all that with his quest to find Brianna, um, which which would force him to move from that spot. You know, um, it's it was just it was great elements. I really appreciated the elements, and I, I appreciated the just the tension that came with it. And and I love how you also get to kind of see how the impact of certain trips that he's taken throughout time are also impacting his mental health. And one thing in particular that that I saw was after he comes back from the trip where he loses Hawkins, he's uh, trying to deliver points three and four about what he's learned on this trip. And you can really see that like he's really heartbroken about losing his dog to time. And his dog, I think, is kind of that companion piece. And I know for me and you, like we're both married, but, you know, at the same time, like, you know, married or or single animals can play a very valued role in our own mental health. Um, I don't know about you. I know you have a dog, but I have two cats and my cats are like when I'm home alone and my wife's at work or she's a, you know, she's away with one of her girlfriends. Like it, it makes all the difference for my own mental health to kind of just be surrounded by animals that are, care enough to be around me like it it makes me feel included and valued in that way and i think that hawkins and steve like i think that that was their relationship and though you see it very briefly in the film the loss of hawkins really made it worth it and even when steve tells dennis later in the movie that you know he's hawkins is, is gone you know he's like surprised and he's like shocked yeah yeah well and we have three dogs we've got a shih tzu that i've had i i got this shih tzu a month before i met maddie so i've had this shih tzu throughout my entire relationship with with my wife and then we have two frenchies and we recently got a new frenchie this uh this fall and maddie has been heavily relying on this little puppy to get her uh through these months she's she's having back surgery next next week and so um, seeing, you know, it, the, the puppies play a big role, uh, here at the house, but, um, yeah. And you saw the, I mean, I, I love the intelligence of his experiments cause he knew that he had a limited supply of pills, but he also knew that he couldn't just go try to find her. He had to understand as much as he could before he did cause he didn't want to kill her. You know, and when he makes that heavy decision before he even goes back and you just see him on the couch with his dog, you're just like, oh, no, he's got to test this out on his dog before he can test it out on a human. And um, you realize then that the, the the chances of this going wrong are high. Um, and um, but, you know, at that point, he was, he, you know, he knows he's dying. He knows his time on, on the earth one way or the other is is limited and he's making hard choices in order to understand as much as he could before he goes and tries to save this girl. So I I appreciated that intelligence um, and the weight of his experiments. And I just thought that that made for good quality writing um, to where you really understand it as much as you could about this um, before the final act. So, and then on that note, I mean, we talked about the end with him dying a hero, um, the way that it cuts, I feel like there's, I mean, it it cuts at a very somber moment, but I feel like there's a chance that he survived. And I've, sh- I've shared with you a picture that I found on the internet that seems to suggest he did. Um, and maybe that was an alternate ending that they didn't use. But at one point, you know, he does learn that if you, if you find an anchor in modern times, you can pull yourself back 
you know, even if you weren't in the right spot when that seven minutes hit. So he did that with the chair. I wonder if his handshake with his best friend, Dennis, at the end was enough to pull him back to current times. He also looks super burnt in that picture. Like I, I ended up when you sent it last night, I ended up like studying it this morning and mm-hmm. I was like, man, like he just looks like burnt. Like he looks like he's having troubles like walking. And so I am almost curious if like he does eventually make it through. And like, if you're going through time and space, like how much in this universe does that have a, like a physical repercussion on your actual like body. Yeah, it could have been that. It could have been a different take of cause of the whole scene. Because, I mean, right before he tries to go back, he saw that dude blow up in front of him. So in this alternate take, maybe he was closer to that explosion or, or something like that. But that, did, that dude did step on like a cannonball or something and, and blew up in front of him, which was pretty, which is pretty badass. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, uh, yeah, I don't, I don't know, but I, I did appreciate that ending that it was, it could go either way, but it certainly felt like a somber moment. Like he was just saying goodbye to his friend and he had, he had, you know, he had done, he had done the thing that he wanted to do with the time he had left. And yeah, that was a, that was a great ending in my book. So before like we wrap up, I think one of the things that kind of like just dawned on me and I I don't want to be like. I don't want to take away your love of this movie. Yeah. <laughs> but why didn't he just bring a gun back to this to like the times where he could, you know, where he was traveling because he had no idea of the threats he was facing. Gun could have been a very easy way to protect himself. You know, that's very true and I, and again, I feel like um I feel like if this film had been in in other people's hands those questions and those elements would have been introduced you know like what if he brought a gun back and then what if he accidentally dropped that gun and how would that have an effect on history and you know what if the chemist didn't die and it was actually a full-on organization and this was happening all over the world and you know i feel like the more of those elements that uh, that get introduced the farther away from the core plot. And I just, you know, I just liked how simple it was, man, that that just one guy, one guy in New Orleans realized that a drug that he got at a dime store was sending him back in time, and it wasn't any bigger than that, you know? And he had he had enough pills to get a job done, and not enough to see what he could take back and stuff like that. And and also, he did see, I guess, to to maybe answer this question, he did see that that items that came back from the past were, you know, like the coin was all kinds of messed up. The sword was all kinds of messed up. The door handle, uh, the doorknob was all kind of messed up. So maybe he figured bringing something to the past would do the same thing to a gun, you know, if he tried to bring something back. Granted, I don't know, but that's, I mean, that could be an answer to that. But I just like how we didn't have time to talk about stuff like that. It was a very tight, contained, uh, urgent story with with its own, um, with its own, you know, stop clock on there, with its own limits. And uh, it it didn't have time or the capacity to stray from that. And that's why I thought it was a really tight film because it just it didn't allow you to think of other things. It, that's that's a fair point. That's a fair uh, analysis as well. I just I, I don't know. By the time that like he starts going on like the third and like fourth trip, but like after the voodoo, I was like, all right, if I was him, I would just like start carrying a gun, man. <laughs> <laughs> because yeah. even the sight of tree of branches, yeah, yeah, even the sight of tree branches, he was just like, oh. <laughs> so I was just kind of like, uh, why not just carry this? Um, but no, I, I enjoyed the fact that, you know, this felt very much more like a scientific excursion rather than a, a safety mission. Like he was willing to lay down his life for the cause of trying to find his best friend's daughter. I, I think that that's a, it was a very noble thing. And like you said, like this film is, is very precise and that's kind of really what helps to, make it 
stand out from other films within the science fiction genre that really fixate on time travel this one you know it's a gamble every time and you're literally risking your life not knowing what you're getting involved into going in unarmed really how would you guys like to help us get mental health resources into schools conventions and other events well now you can Simply go to patreon.com forward slash victims and villains for as little as $1 a month. You guys can help us get mental health resources into current and upcoming generations. Educate and break down stigma surrounding mental health, suicide, and depression. And you get exclusive content that you can't get anywhere else. And you guys can tell us which Nicolas Cage movie you want us to cover and we'll do it. All it takes to get started is to go to patreon.com forward slash victims and villains or simply click the link in the episode description wherever you guys are currently listening or streaming this episode. Pick your tier and get started today. Yes, it's that simple. So quickly select the tier that you want and help us get hope into the hands of the depressed and the suicidal today. Yeah, and I um I'll say one more thing that I brought up in the um in the interview. I was like, well, if this is a time travel drug, why not ever go into the future? And um their response to that was, well, how do you know that they didn't? And on on second watch, I realized that granted some of these you could tell were in the past. Um especially like kind of, you know, with the racists and stuff like that. But certain other ones, like the desert, that could have been in, in a desert future. Um, the very, very first one with the junkies in the hotel, the girl, you know, sees some guy with like a face mask type thing. That could have been in the future. There's a couple of them that, if you think about it, could have been in some type of apocalyptic future. The fact that they were all so vague, um, I just, I just thought, added that much more interesting things and they even joked about uh having one where they were gonna have dinosaurs and i'm just like i'm so glad you didn't because the ones that they picked were scary enough you didn't need some you know low budget velociraptor chasing around anthony mackie for seven minutes you know you just you the elements alone were scary um that you just didn't need that kind of that kind of uh fanfare so I really appreciated the vagueness um, and the the scary elements of each of the uh, the trips through time. Well, how many times too do you end up actually seeing a like time travel movie, and it first thing it does is it goes back in some way, shape, or form to the dinosaurs. Like it's something yeah. that we've seen so many times that it kind of almost seems like a cliche when it comes to time travel movies, and like you had said, like a lot of the events that you know that transpire throughout the course of this film you know could very well have taken place in the past most of them do there but there are those um there are those moments that they're vague enough to where you could say this looks like it could be an apocalyptic future or you know this looks like it could be three weeks from now um, like even the voodoo scene where he pulls up, like, I mean, there are s- certain parts of the country that still practice that. That is a, their country's predominant religion. And so you could say, oh, he just went two weeks into the future. Right. And it doesn't help that still the best dinosaurs hands down to ever grace the screen where in 1997's, no, actually 97 was the sequel, 1993's Jurassic Park. I mean, that that movie, the dinosaurs look real. How many movies can you think of with dinosaurs since then that were good? Not very many. I would say maybe the the director's cut of King Kong, Peter Jackson's King Kong, had some pretty decent looking dinosaurs but even those seemed a little more rubberized than the ones we saw in the original jurassic park so and those were giant blockbusters i don't you know i i just would not want to see this film and this crew you know torn down by trying to make a realistic looking dinosaur when 
so many blockbusters have failed to do so over the past decades. Yeah. Well, let's let's end on a mental health note. We've been kind of talking about mental health a little bit here and there throughout the episode, but uh, there's an throughout the course of this, you know, he. Uh, Steve, who is Anthony Mackey, um, first gets the news of cancer and he's like trying to cope with how to, how to tell Dennis about it and kind of be vulnerable. And, you know, he makes the choice of not telling him and kind of going through chemo. And then he eventually ends up actually, uh, telling him later in the film, right before he goes back in the past to, uh, go get Brianna. But I, I think it kind of, you know, also shines a light on the importance of being vulnerable with your community when you're talking about your own mental health and kind of really what's going on. Um, I I know that for me in the past, like I've had those seasons where I'm just like, man, like I don't know how to tell someone that I'm depressed because I don't think someone else is going to understand. And I think that that's really kind of his, kind of thought process in that scene where he's like i don't really know how dennis is going to take this i think it's probably better if i just don't tell him and you kind of see the the evidence of that kind of like outpour to where like they're they blow up at one another and then ultimately end up kind of going a large portion of the film not talking to one another then it you know so it really does stress the important fact of just being vulnerable with your community well, yeah, and, you know, Mackie's character doesn't want to tell his friend because not too long after Mackie finds out he has cancer, his friend's daughter goes missing. And, it's you know, in Mackie's mind, it's not a good time. And, and you know, um, if you were lucky enough to have a person to rely on, a best friend, a really close family member, um, and, and, and if, if you are a kind and considerate person you're probably always going to find uh that it's not the right time you know there's there's a lot of uh, times when even i've thought of you know oh i just you know i i know they've been busy with work lately i don't want to bring them down stuff like that but almost all the time and then also in this movie by the time you get around to telling them they're just like why didn't you tell me this earlier you know because they could have helped um so i i, I think that is a big part of this is that if you're lucky enough to have a person while it's admirable that you don't want to burden them that's what they're there for you know they're there to help you and they want to be there to help you and if unfortunately you do not have that kind of person in your life it's 2021 man we have apps we have phone lines we have a lot of different things that if you if you don't know list first of all listen to this podcast we'll give you several several suggestions uh but otherwise go to google and just google self-help apps or 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 counselor apps or anything like that and there are people out there who it's literally their job to be the person for you to talk to and and i know it's scary but uh you know the fact that the fact that everybody has the ability to feel alone and to feel drowning and and their and their issues there are people out there that that's that's what they're there for, and that's what they want to be there for to help you with those issues. Um, so don't 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 try to wait for the right time. Just reach out when you need to reach out, and you'll get that relief sooner. And I, I'm glad that you kind of pointed out Mackie's thought process during that about how you know, given the circumstances of what Dennis is going through, like it almost seems like I might come across as a burden and having been in those shoes, I think that a large portion of that thought process and that ideology comes from the depression and the chemistry that it actually has impacted on your brain to where it just kind of makes you feel like a, no one's going to understand what I'm going through. And B, if I tell this already busy person, then I'm going to be a burden to them. That's not always the case. That's, nine times out of 10, that's never the case. And if someone blows up at you because of your depression, that is probably either them trying to process or they just aren't 
the right community for you. And like Josh said, like the reason that we create this content is to provide you with those resources so that you can understand and so that you can get connected with the right counselors and the right people that it is their job to look after and to breathe life into you when it comes down to doing um you know the the right being there to to make sure that you feel heard and to honor and and give you the right uh steps to getting healthy because that's ultimately one of the things that you know Mackie is trying to do throughout the entire film is he's up till synchronic like he's trying to uh, get rid of the cancer by going through chemo. And I think that honoring it and using and going to those resources and counselors and community, you're trying to better yourself and get rid of that depression. Yeah, I, I agree. I think there's, there's a lot more support out there than you realize. And even when it feels like um, it's all, darkness there's there's more light you just got to seek it out you know somebody said the other day if all of if all you're doing on twitter is looking for bad stuff that's all you're going to find if of all if all you're doing is 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 thinking that you know everything around you is dark and depressing and there's no help and there's no hope then it's going to be hard for you to find it but if you believe that there is hope and support out there and you search for it, you'll find that there are a lot of resources and a lot more that you know, um, and and you just got to find the one that works for you. But you got to be willing to reach out your hand and and look for it to begin with. Yeah, first step to healing is reflecting essentially and and acknowledging that there is depression in your life and that changes need to be had. And so we just want to encourage you guys that if you need it, the links are in the descriptions below. And also you guys can, uh, will find a link to pick up Synchronic and check out Josh's interview with Moorhead and Benson. But where can people find you online? Uh, well, they can, they can find my, uh, my movie reviews through the victim and villains website. Um, otherwise they can, Find me on Facebook, um, Fierce Literature, um, or just go to FierceLiterature.com or FierceLit.com, L-I-T.com. Um, that'll show what I'm doing. It usually has my lineup of comic cons and appearances that I'm doing across the nation. Fortunately, that's a little bare right now, a little iffy, a little question marks on calendars as as, uh, as people are deciding whether or not they can have a show this year. Obviously, we're we're on the cusp of getting back to that, but we're not there yet. So I'm a little uh, I'm a little closed down at my house right now, but uh, I look forward to getting back out on the road once things open up and and it's safe for everybody to to commune and hang out together again. Yeah, the same. I, I miss conventions so, so much, man. Right. <laughs> I, I keep seeing like memes that are like that people will post from that I've met over the like conventions and I'm just like we're one day closer to it. One day. Right. All those times you you complained about the sweaty dude next to you in line, <laughs> you're just like, uh to 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 not be worried about being in a line again. Uh that'd be nice. So yeah, it's it's on the horizon, bud. It's on the horizon. So we just got to get through to that horizon. Then we'll be back. Fingers crossed, man. And uh, you guys can find me on Letterboxd at Captain Nostalgia. And uh, for Victims and Villains, uh, VictimsandVillains.net will get you guys our social media, which includes Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, Twitch, and Letterboxd. You guys can also uh, find past episodes movie reviews from Josh and myself and a ocean of talented writers as well as our uh, suicide prevention resource library which can specifically be found at victimsandvillains.net forward slash hope or you guys can just click the links in the descriptions below but that's going to do it for us make sure that you guys pick up Synchronic we're going to go take some Synchronic and we're going to go back to the Ice Age we'll catch you guys soon see ya